Hello, I'm Jim Shore, General Director of Opera Las Vegas, and we're so pleased that you've joined us to celebrate Black History Month with our annual tribute concert, Opera Legends in Black. This viewing is absolutely free to you, but if you're able, there is a donation button at the end of the feature. You can also check out more about Opera Las Vegas at our website, www.operalasvegas.com. And now I'm going to turn the hosting duties over to Hollywood actor Nate Bynum and superstar singer and actress Vanessa Williams. Hello, I'm Nate Bynum, and it's a rare pleasure to host Opera Legends in Black with Vanessa. Good evening, I'm Vanessa Williams, and I'm happy to be your co-host tonight along with Nate Bynum for the Opera Legends in Black tribute concert, celebrating some of the most beloved African-American opera stars and composers of all time. I myself had the honor to step into an opera diva's high heels when I played Carmen in Carmen Jones at the Kennedy Center in 2002, and I know firsthand how challenging the music is, but how glorious the sound is as well. Bass baritone Simone Estes was born in Centerville, Iowa. His father was a coal miner and his grandfather was a former slave. His family was heavily involved in the Baptist Church and his first musical experiences were there. At the University of Iowa, Mr. Estes first majored in psychology, then switching to religion and finally vocal music. Simon was strongly influenced by a faculty member, Charles Kellis. Now Estes had been singing in the school's old gold singers as a first black member. Kellis became Simon's first voice teacher who introduced him to opera and he eventually landed at New York's famed Juilliard School. Like many African-American artists of his day, after graduation, Estes decided to go to Europe where racial prejudice was not as much of a barrier as it was in the United States. In 1965, he made his professional opera debut as Ramfis in Verdi's Aida at the Berlin German Opera to a warm reception. Offers for engagements at major opera houses in Europe soon followed. While Essie's career was thriving in the best European houses and opera festivals, he continued to be spurned by many of the major American houses during the 1970s, being only offered small parts. San Francisco Opera was the most welcoming, with starring roles commensurate of his enormous talent. When he was finally offered a contract to sing at the Metropolitan Opera in 1981, Leontine Price, the first African-American to become a leading prima donna at the Met, cautioned him. It is said that Ms. Price, who suffered actual threats to her life when she first opened at the theater, explained, quote, Simon, you have a beautiful voice. You are musical, intelligent, independent, and handsome. But it's going to be even more difficult for you than for me. However, he signed the contract, and happily the Met audiences and critics responded enthusiastically at his house debut on January 4th, 1982, as Herman in Wagner's Tannhauser. He went on to many other notable successes at the Met. In commemoration of Simon Estes's Met triumph, Opera Las Vegas now presents Eugene Richards singing one of Tannhauser's most beautiful melodies, the hymn to the evening star. Shine as do. 
Born to humble beginnings in Laurel, Mississippi, Mary Violet Leontine Price went on to become one of the most celebrated singers in the history of the operatic art form. One critic characterized Price's voice as vibrant, soaring, and a price beyond pearls. Given a toy piano at the age of three, she began lessons with a local teacher. When she was in kindergarten, her parents traded in the family phonograph as the down payment on an upright piano. At 14, she was taken on a school trip to hear Marian Anderson sing in Jackson, an experience she later said was inspirational. Aiming for a teaching career, Leontine enrolled in the music education program at the all-black Wilberforce College. As her superb talent became more obvious, the famous bass Paul Robeson and Alexander and Elizabeth Chisholm, an affluent white family for whom Leontine's aunt worked as a laundress, provided the needed support that got her into Juilliard. A rising star, she became in demand for recitals, tours, and guest appearances. In November 1954, Price made her recital debut at New York's Town Hall with a program that featured the New York premiere of Samuel Barber's song cycle, Hermit Songs, with the composer at the piano. Then the door to opera opened through television. In February 1955, she sang Puccini's Tosca for the NBC Opera Theater. In March 1955, she was auditioned at Carnegie Hall by the iconic Austrian conductor Herbert von Karajan, who was then touring with the Berlin Philharmonic. Impressed with her singing, Karajan reportedly leapt to the stage to accompany her himself, calling her an artist of the future. Karajan soon brought her to the Vienna State Opera, where she triumphed in her European debut in what would become her signature role, Aida. She made her operatic stage debut in America in San Francisco and eventually became the first African-American to perform at the Metropolitan in a leading role 
with a history-making debut in 1959, the same night as tenor Franco Corelli. The final ovation lasted at least 35 minutes, one of the longest in Met history. She remained one of the company's great treasures until her retirement. We now recall her legendary televised Tosca. The title character is a tempestuous diva and is being extorted by the villainous Baron Scarpia to save the life of her lover, Mario. Tosca intones her famous aria, singing, I lived for art, I lived for love. Dear Lord, why do you reward me this way? Here is Sharonda McKee with a recollection of Leontine Price. George Shirley is one of the most universally beloved tenors in the business. Mr. Shirley earned a degree in music education from Wayne State University in 1955. He was then drafted into the Army, where he became the first black member of the U.S. Army Corps. He was also the first African American hired to teach music in Detroit high schools. He soon moved to New York and began his professional career as a singer. His debut was with a small opera group in Woodstock in Strauss's Die Fledermaus in 1959. And his European debut in Italy was as Rodolfo in Puccini's La Boheme. Mr. Shirley was the first black singer to win the Metropolitan Opera National Council auditions. He was also the first African-American tenor and the only second black male to sing leading roles for the Metropolitan Opera, where he was a popular star for 11 seasons. He has appeared with virtually all of the major international opera houses, and he currently serves as a professor of music at the University of Michigan, where he maintains a studio. 
He has succeeded in all the usual lyric tenor roles, and a favorite was Prince Tamino, which among other venues, he performed at England's famed exclusive Lindenburn Festival. In this aria, Prince Tamino has just been presented by the three ladies with an image of the Princess Pamina and falls instantly in love with her. Join Albert now in celebrating the illustrious talent of George Shirley. Zaubern schön, wie noch kein Auge je gesehen. Ich fühl es, ich fühl es, wie dies Götter Bild mein Herz mit Not. The exceptionally gifted black American soprano Jessie Norman received the scholarship to study at Howard University, continuing her training at the Peabody Conservatory and the University of Michigan. In 1968, she won the prestigious Munich competition, which led to Ms. Norman's operatic debut in 1969 as Elizabeth in Tannhäuser at the Berlin German Opera. 
Her career went from success to success at such important houses as Milan's La Scala, London's Convent Garden, and the Salzburg Festival, to name a few. After an extensive concert tour of North America during 1976-1977, she made her U.S. stage debut in 1982 as Jocasta in Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex and as Purcell's Dido on a double bill with the Opera Company of Philadelphia. She made her triumphant Metropolitan Opera debut as Cassandra and the Trojans by Berlioz, which opened the company's 100th anniversary season in 1983. She remained a mainstay at renowned theaters around the globe. Her wildly successful career included bringing her sumptuous sound and spontaneous passion to numerous recital performances, and her party pieces often included beloved spirituals. To recall Jesse Norman's illustrious career, as we reflect on her untimely passing barely two years ago, here is Lillian Chanel with Talk About a Child That Do Love Jesus. Talk about a child that do love Jesus. While scholarly research was already being done on composer Scott Joplin, he was publicly rediscovered in 1973 when Marvin Hamlish adapted Joplin's Rags to provide the musical soundtrack for the Academy Award-winning movie, The Sting. Thanks to the film, Joplin's work became appreciated in both the popular and classical music world, becoming the classical phenomenon of the decade. The rag, The Entertainer, actually got up to number three on the Billboard charts. Scott Joplin, who refused to accept the limitations imposed on a man born son of a slave, became king of ragtime, and then, at the height of his popularity, turned to serious music. Joplin also composed a good number of songs, as well as the opera Tremonitia, sometimes incorrectly referred to as ragtime opera. He gave the prime of his life to creating this opera, which America was then unwilling to consider. His blazing talent frustrated. Joplin died with his major work unpublished until it was discovered decades later by researcher Vera Brodsky Lawrence, who recognized Joplin's genius and brought it to fruition. The opera's music includes an overture and prelude, 
various recitatives, choruses, small ensemble pieces, a ballet, and several arias. The plot centers on an 18-year-old woman, Trimonisha, who is taught to read and then leads her community against the influence of conjurers who prey on ignorance and superstition. The community realizes the value of education and the liability of their ignorance before choosing her as their teacher and leader. To illustrate the depth and diversity of Joplin's score, we are pleased to showcase four selections from Tremonisha. In a memorable scene when the folks have finished a celebratory dance, Tremonisha notices that the women wear wreaths on their heads and she herself tries to acquire one from a certain tree. However, Monisha stops her in her tracks and tells her of how this special tree is holy. Here is Lillian singing Monisha's aria, The Sacred Tree. In a moralizing moment, the character Remus leads the cast in what is termed a lecture. Here with a further taste of Joplin's masterpiece, listen to Albert intoning the lesson of wrong is never right.
Joplin incorporates folk and spiritual elements in a number of passages like the upcoming selection. When a chorus of laborers hears the sounding of a horn signaling the end of the workday, it is celebrated by Sharonda performing Aunt Dinah Blow the Horn. As Trimanesha concludes, reason and enlightenment have won out over the conjurers. And after the intelligent, forward-thinking Trimanesha is elected the community's leader, they all conclude with a closing number. We end our Trimanesha selections with Scott Joplin's A Real Slow Drag. The glamorous soprano Leona Mitchell 
has had a long and illustrious career, having sung at most of the world's best-known opera venues, including Sydney, Buenos Aires, London, Vienna, Verona, Geneva, Madrid, Toronto, San Francisco, Berlin, Rome, and the Orange Festival in France, not to mention a triumph in the French capital, which had critics heralding the diva as the toast of Paris. Miss Mitchell was a leading soprano of her generation with the Metropolitan Opera, where her roles were varied and illustrious, including many new productions like Ernani, Turandot, and Aida. Leona started singing at an early age in the choir of the Antioch Church of God in Christ in Enid, Oklahoma. Her father, Reverend Dr. Hulan Mitchell, was the minister, and her mother, Dr. Pearl Mitchell, was the pianist. Leona is the tenth of fifteen children born to this union. Her career began in earnest after graduating from the University of Oklahoma. Her overwhelming success prompted her home state to honor her with induction in the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame, and the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. Her hometown of Enid now has a street named Leona Mitchell Boulevard, as well as a museum called the Leona Mitchell Southern Heights Heritage Center and Museum. One of her most acclaimed role assumptions was that of the Countess Alma Viva in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. After other characters hint at the Countess's indiscretions in Act I, she opens the second act with an aria of such poignant elegance that it immediately dispels any scurrilous gossip. Lillian will perform this selection to offer a reflection on the artistry of Leona Mitchell. Bass baritone Eric Owens is one of the most admired opera singers of his generation. His rotund, imposing voice is wedded to an irresistibly charismatic presence on stage. Off stage, Eric is a fan magnet. If you ever see him in the audience attending an event, at intermission, you will notice that admirers will crowd around him five to ten deep to pay their regards to this esteemed an amiable artist. With such roles as Macbeth, Porgy, and the Ring Cycles Alberique already in his repertoire at the world's major houses, 
Mr. Owens continues to create the history of opera. Last season, he returned to Lyric Opera of Chicago to make his role debut as the wanderer in Wagner's Siegfried. He also starred as Porgy in a new production of Porgy and Bess at the Dutch National Opera, in which role he opened the 2019-2020 season at the Metropolitan Opera with Angel Blue. Verdi gave the title character of his Macbeth a great final lament. Eugene Richards salutes the great Eric Owens with this poignant aria, Pity, Respect, Love. It was not an easy route to fame for soprano Martina Arroyo, who was part of the first generation to break down the barriers of racial prejudice in the world of opera. She rose to prominence at the Zurich Opera, after which she became one of the Metropolitan Opera's leading sopranos between 1965 and 1978. She was also a regular presence at every major opera house in the world best known for her performances of Italian spinto repertoire, that is to say, 
She possessed a voice with a weight between lyric and dramatic qualities that can soar over the orchestra in large musical climaxes. She was especially renowned for singing the heroines of Puccini and Verdi. Miss Arroyo had particular luck with the role of Elvira in one of Giuseppe Verdi's early successes, Ernani. It became Verdi's most popular opera until it was surpassed by El Trovatore after 1853. In 1904, it became the first opera to be recorded completely. Its appeal surely lay in the music's youthful pulse. One of Ernani's most popular arias is the soprano showpiece. Although the character Elvira is deeply in love with the handsome bandit Ernani, the tenor, she is to be married against her will to her aging uncle, the obnoxious but wealthy Gomez de Silva, the bass. As Elvira worries about her arranged marriage, she longs for Ornani to return and take her to the nearby caves that the bandits inhabit. Ornani, rescue me, she cries. Sharonda pays homage now to the legendary Martina Arroyo, who was honored with an Opera News Award last season.
We have all been enjoying the keyboard artistry of Daryl Cooper. Daryl, thanks for bringing your wonderful musical gifts to opera legends in black. There are so many acclaimed African-American singers to pick from that we can't get to them all. But we can do a few abbreviated mentions and even triple up as we mash up to a finale. Roland Hayes was a lyric tenor. Recording companies in the early 20th century wanted vaudeville singers, but Hayes was able to break through. In 1939, he recorded with Columbia, and critics lauded his abilities and linguistic skills in French, German, and Italian. Even after Hayes became a successful musician, he faced prejudice. During his tour of Germany in 1923, some people protested against his concert in Berlin. The night of the concert, Roland faced an angry audience who mocked him for 10 minutes. Hayes stood still until they stopped. And then he began soulfully singing Schubert's song, You Are Peace, totally winning over the German audience.
Shirley Varrett and Grace Bumbry had remarkably similar trajectories to their distinguished careers. Both were memorable carmens. Both began their careers as mezzos and ended as sopranos. In 2003, Miss Varrett published a memoir, I Never Walked Alone, in which she spoke frankly about the racism she encountered as a black person in the American classical music world. When the conductor Leopold Stokowski invited her to sing with the Houston Symphony in the early 1960s, he had to rescind his invitation when the orchestra board refused to accept a black soloist. Stokowski later made amends by giving her a prestigious date with the much better known Philadelphia Orchestra. Still, her persistence, consummate artistry, and magnificent talent slowly but surely opened the doors to every major opera and concert venue, where she specialized in Italian roles. Grace Bumbry is considered one of the leading mezzos of her generation, as well as a major soprano. She was a notable member of the pioneering generation of African-American opera and classical singers, paving the way for others. Miss Brumbry's voice was rich and sizable, possessing a wide range, and was capable of producing a very distinctive plangent tone. She gained international renown when she was cast as the sultry Venus in Tannhauser at Germany's Bayreuth Festival in 1961. At age 24, she was the first black singer ever to appear there, which earned her the celebratory title, The Black Venus. Her advice to young singers is to strive for excellence, for that means that you are determined. Following in their footsteps and buoyed by their hard-won success, a third African-American diva has staked a claim to being the international Carmen of choice, the glamorous mezzo Denise Graves, who still maintains a busy career as one of opera's starriest and most sought-after performers. No one in recent memory has appeared as Carmen more often. So now we will evoke the towering trio of Verrett, Bumbry, and Graves with the habanera from Carmen. Contralto Marion Anderson became an important figure in the struggle for black artists to overcome racial prejudice. In 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused permission for Anderson to sing to an integrated audience in Constitution Hall. With the aid of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Anderson famously performed a critically acclaimed open-air concert on Easter Sunday, 1939, to thousands of people on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. One of her selections had an especial poignancy, Marian Anderson's America.
conclusion, the great baritone William Warfield was a major talent. His significant accomplishments include the first recording of Copeland's All-American Song, the film of Showboat, and most especially, he headed several major touring productions of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. A memory of Mr. Warfield as Porgy will finish up tonight's program. It has been Nate and my pleasure to be your host for this stirring tribute. Ladies and gentlemen, the cast of Opera Legends in Black sing you out with, I'm on my way.